In 1347, the year 1347, a ship from the Far East landed at Messina in southern Italy, and it carried with it the Black Death. It introduced the Black Death into Europe. The Black Death was a bacteria-borne disease which uh, took various forms. It was uh, carried in the blood of a certain type of rats, and the fleas that uh, fed on the rats carried that disease, and when the rats died, they transferred it to humans. It was a terrible disease, a terrible plague, and it affected human beings. And the, pl the plague produced different effects in people. One of the common ones was, a, it was referred to as a bu bubonic plague. And what that was, was a fist-sized swelling wherever the fleas bit a person, in their neck or under their armpits or in the groin. And this was a, um, <clears throat> a red swelling which very shortly turned dark purple and then black. And that's why it was called the Black Death, because people died from that within two to six days. Other forms were a pneumonic plague, where it entered the lungs and destroyed the lungs, and people uh, spit out blood and passed the disease on through coughing and sneezing. Other forms of that, it got into the bloodstream, and uh, people were killed almost instantly. The speed uh, with which the disease could kill was terrifying to inhabitants of the medieval world. One Italian author claimed that the plague victims ate lunch with their friends and dinner, dinner with their ancestors in paradise. It was a terrible thing. The Black Death reached England in the summer of 1348, traveling from Italy on up through. It spread through Europe, uh, by best estimates, something like a third of the population of Europe died uh, with the Black Plague. Over the next two years, the disease killed between 30 and 40 percent of the entire population of England, and the death toll rose in England to over two million. Uh, by the end of 1350, the Black Death had subsided, but it never really died out in England for the next several hundred years. And it wasn't until late in the 17th century that this plague eventually disappeared. And, of course, the Black Death, this plague, changed the whole face of society within uh, Europe, within England, and elsewhere. Well, this morning, the plague that we're looking at is worse, far worse, than the Black Death, than the Black Plague. Because it, is, it has been devastating, not just for a few years or for a few centuries, but for millennial, millennia, this plague has plagued people. And it's far worse. And in fact, uh, terrible as the Black Death was in suffering and misery, this plague that we're going to look at this morning leads to far greater and devastating misery, if not corrected. This is, this is what we're looking at this morning. Now, you recall previously, uh, we have looked at uh, the bad news, the beginning part of Romans, chapters 1 through the first three, first three and a half chapters, two and a half chapters. And uh, we've seen the bad news, how that uh, there is none good. There is none righteous in the sight of God. All have sinned. We're all under the judgment of God. All mankind, a plague of judgment upon, of, upon our sin, a plague of death. And we've also looked at the good news. In, uh, from the middle of chapter 3 down to uh, verse 11, last week, the good news of salvation. The good news is that there is a remedy for this plague of death and destruction. And we've seen that, and we've seen about how we can be justified how our sins can be forgiven. We can be reconciled to God. We can be born again. 
We can be made new creations in Jesus Christ. And we've looked at that. The good news of salvation. The salvation from the penalty of our sin. But then we think, well, what now? Okay, I am saved. I've been born again. I'm a new creation. What now? How can I live for Christ? How can I live the Christian life? How is it possible for me to live the Christian life? How can I get victory over my sinful desires and those things within? So let's just read the passage in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, just as through one man sin sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law was, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this passage is a a very compact, dense passage containing many concepts, many ideas, many terms. And um, as I studied through this, I realized that it's not going to be possible to go into all the details that are in this passage. So we'll step back and we'll look at this passage from this perspective. The two streams of history. There are two streams of history. So I'm going to look at it as an overview. The other thing about this passage is it's pivotal. Up to now, we've been looking at justification, forgiveness, being born again, salvation. We've been looking at the, the fact that the penalty for our sins, plural, was paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, Paul shifts to our sin, in a sense. Our sin nature, if you would have it. Our being of sin. The reason why we sin. There is a definite shift here in this uh, book. And it continues through chapters 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> so I want to look this morning at the two streams of history. The stream of history that flows from Adam and the stream of history that flows from Christ. There's only two streams of history. You're in one or the other. There's only two. There's no other. And we could summarize the passage this way. I think it's on your outline. By the disobedience of one man, Adam, 
all people became sinners. But by the obedience of one man, Christ, all may become righteous, which results in life. By the disobedience of one man, Adam, all people became sinners. But by the obedience of one man, Christ, all may become righteous, which results in life. It's a choice, you can see. There is a choice there. All may become righteous. So let's look at the stream that flows from Adam. Up on the screen. Adam is its source. Adam is the father of all of us, in a sense. He is our natural father. We've all descended from Adam. And this passage speaks about how Adam sinned and how that sin brought death into the world. And then as a result, every one of Adam's descendants was born as a sinner. We'll talk about this later, what that means. As a sinner, separated from God, and all men sinned. Now there's a thing called the butterfly effect, which is... Uh, it's actually quite well known. I got this definition from Wikipedia. And if you look on the uh, internet, you'll find it all over. But the idea here is that <clears throat> a butterfly flapping its wings, say, over in Africa, could, have, could result in a tornado occurring over here in North America. And uh, I see some uh, have heard of this idea before. It's uh, tied into... Uh, chaos theory into these very complex systems, a complex system like a weather system. And uh, this is a theory that's uh, put forth that <clears throat> a very small effect over way off in some distant land could have a tremendous effect in another part of the world. Now, maybe the, you might think of this a little differently. You can imagine, for example, if you sat a ball on top of a hill... You know, it might roll in one of many, several different directions based on a very, very small difference in its initial condition, whether you just exactly where you placed it and so on. So it could, it could go in various different directions. Well, in a sense, um, <clears throat> you know, this is a butterfly effect, what happened uh, way back then. It's, it's ended up, in a, like, in a sense, like a tornado. Now, some people might question, was Adam a real person, or was he just a myth? Now, science is more and more, of course, finding out that we all did descend from uh, one person, Adam, but uh, they wouldn't put the name Adam on him, but he, they did. Now, Paul clearly believed in a historical Adam. Here in Romans and in Corinthians, he speaks about Adam and ties it into doctrine. And Jesus himself... Uh, <clears throat> believed in Adam. And in, uh, for example, he didn't refer to Adam by name, but in uh, Matthew chapter 19, speaking about marriage, he said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Referring to Adam and Eve. So if Jesus himself believed in a real Adam, a literal Adam, then that's good enough for me, at least. I trust it's good enough for you. Adam was a real person. And what happened? You know, verse 12 of our chapter, Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. This, of course, is, as you know, is the, referred to as the fall. That terrible event that catastrophic event that occurred back in the beginning. Adam sinned. And in this passage, I've counted up 18 times where that's mentioned. It's mentioned as sin. It's mentioned as transgressing. Literally, just going against what God says. It's, it's described as an offense against God. 
and it's described as disobedience or rebellion and unbelief against what the Lord has said. Adam sinned, and immediately he died. Actually, if if you were to read uh, chapter uh, 2 and uh, verse 17, you recall that the Lord told Adam, he said there in verse 17 of chapter 2 of Genesis, but from the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. He had previously, in verse 16, told them they could eat of anything in the garden. He provided them everything they could need, everything they could want. Everything was there for them. But he he told them there was one tree they could not eat of. For he said, For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But when the Lord came out in the cool of the evening, to talk to Adam and Eve, he didn't find dead bodies under the tree. They were hiding in the bushes. So what does he mean? In the day that you eat it, of it you shall die. Well, of course, death. We stop and think about death. Death is separation. If you have a loved one that's died, uh, then you may be assured that they're in heaven and you're happy for them for that, but you still grieve over the loss because you can't talk to them. You can't enjoy their presence. You can't communicate with them. They're separate from you. And so it is with this situation here. This was a spiritual death. Adam was severed from the life of God. And what happened? As we've read here in our passage, the reign of death entered the world. A reign of death. Verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And verse 17, For if by the transgression of the, of the one, death reigned through the world. It was like the ripple effect. It was like the plague when those, that ship landed on the shore of Europe and brought that plague. This is a plague that's far worse. It's the reign of death that's come into the world. And it affects every single one on this planet born of Adam. Born as a descendant of Adam. So, what did the Lord mean when he said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die? Well, we know that man is made up of three parts body, soul, and spirit. Now, there are some who uh, would consider that man is a a two-part person, uh, the material part and the immaterial. But, for example, in verses uh, like 1 Corinthians, uh, or 1 Thessalonians 5, near the end of the chapter, I believe it's verse 22 or 23, uh, where the Apostle Paul says, may your whole spirit be preserved, your whole body and soul and spirit be preserved. Uh, It seems to be that there's three components body, soul, and spirit. Well, looking at this triangle, the body. You know what that is. That's what you saw this morning when you looked in the mirror. You washed it. You cleaned its teeth. You put some clothes on it. You uh, fed it. You uh, moved it into the car, and here you are. You know, that's the body. Maybe you shaved it, for some of you. Maybe others painted it, but uh, whatever. (laughs) That's your body. We all know what our body is. The soul. What's the soul? We read in Genesis that God created man in his image, in his image and in his likeness, with a mind to know God, with emotions to respond to God, and with a will to choose God. This is the essence of of each one of us, our soul. This is what, uh, this is the spirit of, of life within. And most of us spend a good part of our lives trying to keep that body and soul together. We're really desperately trying to avoid those things getting apart. Um, actually, if you go to any 
uh, city in the land, any bigger center in the land, you'll find, usually you'll find this uh, great edifice there that's devoted to keeping the body and soul together. What is it? It's not a church. It's a hospital. You see, that's what we spend great effort on, keeping the body and the soul together. But there's a third part of man, and that's his spirit. God is spirit. And it's through our spirit that we relate to God. We communicate to God. We know God. We experience God. It's in our spirit. It's in the spirit of man that, we, that this happens. That's the aspect there. And what happened to Adam when he sinned in the day when they took of that fruit, they died. Then, instantly, they were separated from God. Their spirit was separated from God, who is spirit. There was a disconnect there. And how do we know that? God put them out of the garden. And he put a, an angel at the entrance to the gar garden with a flaming sword to prevent them from returning. Life forms. You know, there's three kinds of life forms. There's plants and animals and humans. Just to illustrate this a little further, but, you know, you think of a plant. Maybe you've got a plant in your living room. Well, it has a body, but it doesn't have a soul. You can't talk to it. I mean, some people talk to plants, but, um, you know, you really can't talk back to you anyway. I guess you can talk to it, but it can't talk back to you. Uh, some people think if you love it, maybe it'll grow better, but, you know, it's, it's got a body. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a spirit. An animal. Now, according to the Old Testament uh, thinking, now it's, in a sense, an animal has a body, of course. Just look at your dog and your cat. You know it's got a body. But it also has a life force within it. You could call it a soul in terms of the Old Testament without getting into a lot of detail here on the theology of all of this. But you think of, a, uh, of your dog. You can teach it tricks. You can teach it to sit, to beg, to roll over, to do different things. Maybe does an animal have emotions? I don't know. Um, you know, you see a picture of a, of a cat, your cat, your friendly little cat, and this fierce dog comes along. What happens? <clears throat> you know, the cat uh, just rears up. So, um, <clears throat> but of course... A dog doesn't start asking questions. Well, where do I come from? You know, what's, what's the meaning of life? Um, you know, the cow in the field doesn't look up in the skies and say, well, what's out there? I mean, that's, uh, you know, they, they don't have that. That's what man is. That's who we are. That's how we're made. To relate to God. And that's why man today there's a void within, in many cases, because we are born naturally in this state of deadness. Our spirit is, is dead to God, but it's separated from God. So there's that within us, our, within our own spirit. We know there's something more. We don't know what it is because of that deadness. The why, who, and where questions. You know, why do we ask these questions? It's because his spirit is dead to God. He is dysfunctional. The part that makes man human is dead. The part that makes him man has been severed from its source. So the reign of death. Adam sinned and then died. And naturally, we inherit Adam's fallen condition. A spirit disconnected with God. Now, we are different than Adam in this way. Adam sinned and death came. We are dead, so we sin. It's sort of the opposite. We are naturally dead. At one time, Adam was alive to God and he died. We are now born dead. Naturally, through Adam's stream, Adam is the source. And as a result, we have that 
thing within us that causes us to rebel against God, that causes us to disbelieve the Lord, that causes us to go against Him. You know, just even that verse in chapter 6 and 23 in this, in this book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. That's a present reality. That's not a future. That's not talking about when you die and be put in the grave. I mean, that's another aspect of death. But this verse is talking about the present. It's a present reality. So from Adam, death reigns. We saw that in verses 14 and 17. And also we find in verse 21 that as sin reigned in death, sin reigns. And these are the two things that rule and govern naturally in our world. Sin and death. And we can say that death and sin, if you're following the outline, death and sin are the governing principles in our natural world today for all those whose source is Adam. For all those in the stream of life from Adam. Death and sin is what is king if you're in that natural stream. But thanks be to the Lord, there is another stream. And that stream flows from Christ. Christ, who was without sin, who was the righteousness of God, and from Him comes life. Now, this stream that flows from Christ is both the opposite to the stream from Adam, and it also rectifies the problem created by Adam. It does both. For in this passage, as we have read, there is life to the many. Righteousness is given as a gift of God's grace. So looking at uh, this, uh, um, <clears throat> I see on the overhead here, our, our older PowerPoint version isn't working quite correctly, but uh, the basic thing is, from Christ, life reigns. Not death, life. Look at verse 17 at the end. And much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And from Christ, righteousness reigns. In that same verse, it's righteousness that reigns. And in verse 21, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life. And grace reigns, as we have read. So there's the reign of death and sin, or the reign of life and righteousness. So, on the outline, life and righteousness are the governing principles for all those whose source is Christ. For all those in the stream of life from Christ. And it comes by God's grace, as we've read several times over in this passage. So there's two sources. There's two reigns. Every person on this planet is in one or the other of these streams of history. That's what this passage is saying. For the person, we've looked last few weeks at the fact that we can be justified. For the person who has been born again, who has received new life in Christ, they're now under the reign of life on this comparison chart. Christ died so we could have life. Verse 16 at the end. <clears throat> on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification or life. And also in verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Christ. Rather than uh, being under uh, Adam, Adam's reign and his sin. It's, secondly, it's a gift from God. It's not inherited. Adam's what we inherited from Adam, it was inherited naturally from Adam, our state of deadness. This is not something we inherit. This is a gift from God through faith. We are alive 
So we supernaturally do the right thing. Now, Adam's race is dead, and so sin is the natural consequence. But we are alive in Christ. The born-again believer is alive and supernaturally does the right thing. Righteousness, the right thing. Um, <clears throat> it's a new birth and a new nature where Christ reigns through his Spirit. So the glorious result, last week we saw several, I think there were seven components of the glorious results of justification. Our brother Mark talked about that. Here we have another glorious result, an overall glorious result. The new birth transfers a person from the realm of Adam to the realm of Christ. We are justified, reconciled. That's the first, up to chapter 5, verse 11. The penalty of our sins has been paid. But there is much more. Justification is only the first step leading to a greater purpose. I mean, great as justification is, I mean, we marvel at it and we thank the Lord for it, but it's only the first step in what God intends. And that's what this chapter is all about. He's moving on to how do we live the Christian life now? How is it possible to have victory in our lives? You see, it's like, uh, it's like a marriage. You know, in, uh, in Genesis, again, we read that a man shall leave his mother and father and uh, cleave to his wife. You know, there's a, a leaving and a joining with the new person, with the spouse. There's two aspects of marriage. Now, if I was to tell you, supposing you ask me, well, tell me about your marriage. Well, 44 years ago, I left my mother and father. I think you'd be one. well, well, I mean, what, what's, yeah, so what's, what's next? I mean, you know, it's, it's only half the story. I mean, it's the minor half of the story, really, in a, in a way, compared to the greater half of the story. Yes, I, be, I joined, I became married to Beverly. I mean, it's not just the leaving of our sin behind in justification. We are joined to another. There's two elements there. There's two elements of what the Lord has done for us. And it's a glorious and grand thing. You know, some we know of folks who continually look back to that time when they were born again, and I do that. Um, but I rejoice in the fact that, yes, look at what the Lord has done for me since that time. I don't just live at that past event. We live in the glories of what God is doing for us today. So, don't just leave the old life behind, but realize and dwell in the new life that is there. There is much more. We read, having been reconciled, much more we will be saved by Christ's life. Just look at that in verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The power of our, own, or our old sinful nature has been broken. That's what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Not only paid the penalty, but he's broken the power. And we have been freed to jo be joined to another who reigns in our life. We reign in life through the Lord Jesus, who is our life. He reigns, and we reign with him. And there's a hymn that really describes this. It's number 376 in our hymn book. Captures the essence of this. It says, Out of my bondage and sorrow and night, into thy freedom, gladness, and, and light. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want, and into thy wealth. Out of my sin, and into thyself. You see, there's, a, there's the out of the old and into the new. And we have so much in the new in this new reign of Christ 
this reign of life and righteousness and God's grace and what he imparts to us through that and the fact that we can reign with him in, in life. I mean, you can read the whole hymn. Like All four verses are talking about this. Out of that situation and into this. Just like the uh, nation of Israel, if you want to look at it. God led them out of captivity in Egypt. Why? To lead them into the promised land. But through unbelief, they spent 40 years wandering around in the desert. But there was a purpose. That's what he wants for us. He wants that glorious end result. Conclusion. The consequences of Adam's fall can be completely reversed. You have, ne- you have left the darkness of your former self. You have been justified. Now come in. Come into the blessings of life and righteousness. Just by way of an example, I was reading the other day of, a, of the situation in Iraq. As you know, there's much death and destruction and killing and murder and so on that's going on in Iraq. And there's something like a million people that have left, have fled the country of Iraq. They've fled to escape the devastation that's there. And they've gone into the surrounding countries which in some cases is not an awful lot better than where they came from. I mean, they've been freed from that death and destruction, but they're still under an oppressive regime. And their desire is to come to the West, to come to the United States or North America, because they know that's where freedom is. And this guy was talking about how he had worked for the Americans and how he had managed to get a visa, and he was writing from the U.S. And here was a man who had come out of that death and destruction, not, not just been uh, saved out of that particular situation uh, into a a system of drudgery and so on. He'd been freed, and he was in the United States writing as a free man. There's only a few people, actually, that are allowed to do that from Iraq. I think they're only allowing 50 people a year or something to come. But that's what the Lord has for us this morning. He wants us to dwell in the benefits and and the blessings of this new creation life that he's given to us. You know, there's two streams. Yes, if you're a born-again believer this morning, you have left the stream of Adam. You're now in the stream that flows from Christ. He is our source. But there's much more than the fact that he's paid the penalty of our sin. He has broken the power of our sin nature and through the Spirit of God enables us to live a victorious life for him. If you have your application, just... On the back, if you'd uh, <clears throat> just try to put some of these comments down on the back by way of application. So the first question, to which stream of life do you belong? This is fundamental. To which stream of life do you belong? Do you... Hmm, I see my numbers got mixed up here. Some of, them. some of you might have three and four in place of one and two. Uh, anyhow... Uh, Sorry about that. Um, The stream from Adam, which stream do you belong? The stream from Adam or the stream from Christ? Who is the source of your life? Adam or Christ? There is no other, in a sense. Maybe you're the source of your own life. Maybe you think you're the source of your own life. But who is the source of your life? What governing principle rules your life? Is it death and sin? Or is it life and righteousness? Now, for those who answered the second questions above, you know that the penalty for your sins has been paid. You have been justified and forgiven through Christ's dead death and shed blood on the cross. You know this. You rejoice in it. You thank God for it. It's one of the greatest blessings we could ever have. Thank God for it. But do you also know that the power of sin in your life has been broken through your identification with Christ in his death and resurrection? We are identified with him. And we'll be looking at this more in chapters 6, 7, and 8. He is our source. He is our identity. He is the purpose of our life. 
He is the being of our life. He is the one who rules in our life through His Spirit. And it is Him that breaks the power of sin in our life. You know, you've come out. You've come out of the bondage and the guilt of your sin, I think is what him says. Now come into the blessings of this glorious new life, a life of righteousness and a life that's full of life and victory in Christ. It's grace that reigns. It's a gift of God. And it's received by faith, this second part of the story. And this is the, the second aspect of the story, which, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at in more detail as we look at chapters 6, 7, and 8. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this book of Romans that lays out so clearly your plan of redemption from an eternity past through to the end of the ages and how that you love each one of us individually and you desire to rescue us from the reign of sin and death in our lives. And not only that, that you desire to free us and enable us and to equip us through your Spirit to live a victorious Christian life for you. Thank you, in Jesus' name.